All right, let's talk a little bit about what we really mean by perfectly competitive market. Well, it's, uh, to be honest, an abstraction of reality. You can't really find a perfectly competitive market in reality uh, for many reasons. But let's uh, talk about the specific assumptions uh, when we say a market is perfectly competitive. Well, uh, a market is perfectly competitive means uh, that me it means there are many buyers, a large number of buyers and large number of sellers. Uh, so what does that mean? You know, you know, what number is large? What number is small? Well, it's, it's hard to put any boundary for this, but the idea should be the following. No individual buyer and no individual seller has the power to change, influence the market price. All right. So if you can think of uh, 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 for example, a market for uh, smartphones, clearly it's not perfectly competitive because there are very few producers out there on the market. And so, for example, Apple's, uh, Apple is a very strong player and they basically determine their own product's price. Same for Samsung. All right. Uh, so they're not price takers in that sense. They can, they can, they can, they can charge any price they want. Yes, the consumers also, consumers' behavior and preferences also affect their pricing behavior normally. But that doesn't mean that they take the price as given. All right. Well, a, a, a market that is maybe a closer to uh, a perfectly competitive market would be. Uh, when you go to eBay or, or Amazon and search for a very common good, for example, a textbook, all right? So a sort of advanced microeconomic theory textbook by textbook by Mr. X. So probably there's going to be you know bunch of sellers there. They they posted their uh, online ads, uh, and so therefore uh, you'll see a lot of sellers. I mean, lately, to be honest, when Amazon first started operating, I, I remember. Uh, it was completely nothing but a uh, bookseller. And so there were definitely much more uh, sellers uh, when you search a specific book. Lately, uh, the number of sellers reduced significantly. But anyway, for many other goods, for example, if you, if you search for some particular toy, for example, there's, you, you're going to see a lot of sellers uh, selling exactly the same thing. And so that market resembles a bit more perfectly competitive markets. All right. Um, well, the second important thing is that the older sellers produce exactly the same homogenous product. So this is, again, it's a, a very strong uh, uh, requirement that is, you know, almost impossible to match up in reality. Well, why is that? So, so what does that mean? That means the products are identical in, in any uh, dimension. All right. This is, again, not really possible. So if you think of restaurants, for example, uh, well, it is, I mean, it seems like a, a, a highly competitive market, right? For example, think of uh, restaurants in Toronto downtown or maybe New York City. So there are like millions of them. Uh, but the thing is, they're not really producing the same product, right? Some of them are selling Italian food. Some of them are selling Chinese, Vietnamese or Taiwan or, or Thai food so, or Japanese sushi. So they are actually differentiating their products. On top of that, all right, I mean, let's focus on, uh, you know, all the sushi restaurants in downtown Toronto. Well, still, uh, although it looks like, you know, competitive market, it really is not. They're not really selling exactly the same uh, uh, product. Well, yes, they are selling sushi, but they have different, uh, you know, chefs. And so the, the, the quality of the chefs probably differs. The quality of the... Um, the, the raw material they use or the, you know any other material they use matters. Their specific location matters. Uh, the the ambiance, uh, the, the how they set up the restaurant matters, so on and so forth, right? The reputation on Yelp reviews, for example, matters. So in fact, I mean, it's very hard to find exactly same producers uh, in, in today's uh, market environments. But again, don't forget, these are sort of uh, perfectly competitive market is just an abstraction of the reality. So it's a it's the simplest possible environment you can think of. And once you understand this, you can I mean, you can sort of uh, uh, twist some of the assumptions and see how the, you know, the dynamics are going to change. So that's how we basically I mean, this is why we use those sort of baseline models. All right. What else? Uh, each firm is is maximizing profit. 
uh, well, that sounds obvious, but well, not all firms are maximizing profits, right? For example, if it is an NGO, clearly it's not maximizing profit. Um, well, four, the fourth one is that the prices are known by all the participants, but you can think of this as not only prices, but everything, uh, every information is, 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 is common knowledge. It, it's, it's perfectly known by everybody, all right? Um, so the information is perfect. So you can think, for example, the stock market, is it a perfectly competitive market, right? I mean, for any particular stock, uh, there are many sellers, many buyers, right? Um, well, unfortunately, the information is not really perfect. So for example, some sellers or some buyers actually watch this particular stock very closely, or maybe they have some insider information. And you see what I mean? So therefore, even though there might be many buyers and many sellers for each particular stock, that doesn't, I mean, and all of them are sort of, if, if you're a seller of a stock of, for example, Apple, well, you're selling Apple stock, right? Everybody's selling exactly the same thing. So it's perfectly homogenous product. Well, but the problem is, I mean, sometimes the information may not be perfect, all right? Um, and then the transactions are costless or, you know, they're very negligible. They, they do not derive, uh, they do not uh, uh, put a uh, significant uh, incentive to change uh, the consumer's or the producer's behavior, all right? So what do we mean by transactions? Are what type of transactions are there? Well, I mean, when a buyer and seller uh, makes a trade, uh, well, sometimes they, you know, the buyer pays a commission to the market setter, right? For example, if you are uh, selling something on Amazon, if you're selling a product, unfortunately or fortunately, that depends how you look at it, uh, you know, a, a part of your revenue is going to go to the Amazon, right? The, the markets, uh, uh, the firm that is setting this market or same for eBay. Um, so therefore, there are, there's almost always a transaction. Uh, but again, it's like, let's assume that all these transactions are, 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 are not there or they are sort of very minor, sort of uh, insignificant, right? So if a market satisfies those properties, once again, in real life, uh, there's almost no way you can match exactly all the criteria, but you can sort of approximate, right? You know, some markets are very close to perfectly, being perfectly competitive. But others, for example, as I said, uh, if you look at the uh, cell phone producers or the, you know, the market for cell phones, it's clearly not uh, not even close to being perfectly competitive or for a, uh, sort of, uh, oil, the market for oil or electricity, these are clearly not uh, close to being a perfectly competitive market because there are a very, very small number of sellers. In terms of buyers, uh, there's no point, uh, there's no uh, problem, but in terms of sellers, uh, it's, it's a very significant, uh, you know, there is a very uh, small number of sellers and so they have power to influence the market price. Okay. 